Um, so it's my great pleasure and honor um, to um, present Mina Caravanta. Um, Mina is a dear friend and colleague and has been for a long time. Uh, she's an associate professor of theory, comparative literary cultural studies and global English literatures in the Department of English Language and Literature, the School of Philosophy at the National and Capodistrian University of Athens in Greece. She specializes in post-colonial and decolonial studies, critical theory, gender studies, comparative literature, and global English literatures. She has published numerous articles in international academic journals, such as Boundary 2, Kalalu, Feminist Review, Modern Fiction Studies, Mosaic, Simploki, Journal of Com Contemporary Theory. Her work has also appeared in edited volumes abroad and in Greece. She has co-edited Interculturality and Gender with Juan Anim Addo and Giovanna Covey, and um, Edward Said and Jacques Derrida, Reconstellating Humanism and the Global Hybrid with uh, Nina Morgan. Mina is a founding member and co-editor of a wonderful journal I've had the <laughs> joy of contributing to, um, the electronic journal Synthesis, an anglophone journal of comparative literary studies. Synthesis promotes transcultural and interdisciplinary research and features international editorial and academic boards. Mina has participated in international conference all over the world and given invited talks in the US, in Europe, the Caribbean and Australia, and today at the Ecole Normale Supérieure in Paris. So thank you so much, Mina, for accepting the invitation and for your talk today, which is entitled Migrations of the Human, Apropos the Community of the World. Thank you. Um, Uh, je remercie ma chère collègue et amie, uh, professeure Elena J, pour cette uh, invitation et pour sa hospitalité et générosité d'esprit. Um, c'est un, uh, un grand honneur et vraiment plaisir pour moi uh, de présenter mes idées ici dans ces salles qui résonnent de l'enseignement et des séminaires de plus grands philosophes, poètes et, et professeurs. Uh, et je vous remercie à uh, tous, étudiants et collègues, um, pour être ici. Um, it will be with great pleasure um, to share some of the ideas. I have to switch into English now so that I don't keep embarrassing myself in French, a language that I absolutely adore. It's um, funny, but I read Nancy and Derrida, whose works I'll be briefly talking about today in French, but there are times when, you know, at Starbucks, they'll ask me, quel est votre prénom? And go like, what, what do you just say? <laughs> I guess it's because I haven't lived in, you know, spent enough time in Paris lately. And it's a pleasure to be back in this uh, wonderful city at this very, you know, um, extremely important uh, institution of philosophical thought, among other things. Um, this, um, <clears throat> I'm currently writing the last chapter of a book I'm working on, on migration, but it's not um, the kind of book you would see normally in social sciences. What I'm trying to do in different chapters is bring together different literary texts, philosophers, documentary, works of art, and photography to study, to not study, but to follow the flow of different migrations from the past and in the present so that I discuss the ways by which the concept of the human is propelled forward and changes because of them. So it's more about how the concept uh, of the human also is also radicalized by these past and present histories of migration than, you know, a specific social analysis of such of this or that, you know, history and its effects on the present. And how we might 
by reconstellating those different histories of migration together, we can um, rethink a very important concept today, which is that of relation. And this is what, in my last chapter, uh, which takes on uh, the work of Edouard Glissant, um, uh, Jacques Derrida, and Jean-Luc Lancy, among other thinkers, uh, is the concept that I want to share with you. Now, one thing that may, be, um, that may not be as clear in the process of uh, this presentation is why I'm choosing uh, such a, a strange a combination of thinkers, Jean Clancy and Jacques Derrida from, you know, European philosophical uh, context, and then Edouard Glissant, Martinican uh, poet and very, very important um, for me thinker in what you would call at large post-colonial studies. Um, and I think it's important to bring them together, this kind of deconstructive inheritance and the decolonial poetics or thought, so that we start really uh, radicalizing and transforming some of the concepts that, that we use by which we can understand living together today. So, you know, I'm not gonna, it's, it's a paper, it's a chapter that is informed by decolonial thinkers like Sylvia Winter that we'll be discussing with some of you tomorrow, and Walter Mignolo, people that is, who are taking off from, um, in, in, an entirely different tradition in the sense that they draw on Latin American indigenous knowledges and epistemologies so that they uh, resist this Eurocentric philosophical way of thinking. And I reconstellate them with European philosophers, except that I take those two, especially Derrida, but also Nancy in this chapter, who are also uh, transforming or tried to transform in the work uh, the philosophical way by which we think about community living together, or what these two thinkers at different moments call the community of the world. So this phrase, the community of the world, comes from Jean-Luc Nancy's later and Derrida's um, later work and Derrida's last seminar. And it's a very strange phrase, community of the world, because it brings two things together that don't seem to belong together. And that's what I want to be labor with you as I follow the trace of Glissant's thought, uh, some images from some documentary art work that I'll be sharing with you, um, an excerpt from a literary text um, by Patrick Chamoiseau, à la Prente de Crousseau. Um, and this way I try to create an archive that will allow us to think relation together today, hoping that I won't lose you on the way. I'll just try to very briefly sketch what I'm doing uh, here. Um, so, as different worlds are thrown together while others are disappearing and human beings among other species are migrating to survive destruction, the world becomes inevitably shared, albeit unevenly so. The sharing of the world, experienced in a threatening or welcoming vicinity, not only through the trafficking of commodities, but also through the ongoing histories of destitution and dispossession, that deprive human beings of their living rights, radically transforms the concepts of relation and living together that form the basis of cohabitation and survival today. But how are we to think of relation in a world where neoliberalism threatens to commodify all relations in the, names, in the name of interest? If the market logic of exchange has co-opted all spheres of human life, political and social, and not just economic, as Lisa Lowe argues in her work. What kind of politics of relation can we imagine that escapes what Lisa Lowe calls the principles of a market economy and can possibly open the path to another politics that resists the financialization of life as human capital? Again, that's a phrase from her work. Edouard Glissant proposes that relation be thought as emerging for, from what he calls the chaos world, that is, the shock, the intertwining, the repulsions, attractions, complicities, oppositions, and conflicts between the cultures of peoples in the contemporary world totality. So in fact, he sees the relation embedded in what threatens relation rather than the opposite. This chaos world, 
proliferates relation, according to Glissant, um, that is not based on national or ethnic ties, but is rather embedded in the overlapping and intertwining of different collectivities and individuals and their respective places and temporalities that have been propelled together by the forces of colonialism, capitalism, and neoliberalism. Always capitalized as a noun in his work, relation determines the way the world, what he calls the tout monde, uh, and differentiates from cosmopolitanism. Um, so this, this kind of relation determines the world in the making as it expands like an archipelago of seemingly distant and smaller worlds that, like islands, are connected by the sea and are thrust into vicinity by the ongoing histories of disaster and dispossession, but also for Glissant by the cultural reciprocities and exchanges, linguistic and aesthetic realizing practices and poetic reinventions of the human that try to respond to the unevenly task of cohabiting the earth. So to think relation means for Glissant to think poetically in our effort to attend to the histories, stories and cries of the dispossessed, which force the collapse of the absolute of history that have omitted or misrepresented these other humans, the enslaved humans, the outcasts and the disappeared as the ones who were without history, supposedly without history. Relation, Glissant repeats, cannot be thought outside the frame of a poetics that creolizes the term by which cultures and languages meet and overlap. And this is, of course, a very famous methodology and terminology that also comes from Edward Said and his analysis of how cultures are affected in culture and imperialism. You will recognize that. So for him, this poetics creolizes the terms by which cultures and languages meet and overlap generating new conceptual frameworks by which to think about the world that transgress the sedimented concepts of colonial modernity, that is, man and other, human and animal, or stone, as we will see, citizen and stateless. This is because for Glissant relation arises from the disharmony and turbulence of a chaos world, where the rights to cohabitation and living rights are neither secured nor guaranteed for all, but must be fought for against the governance of the dominant rules and laws. And this is a, a quote from Le Tout Monde. He, the Tout Monde is part of a chaos world which emerges as a shared place of destitution in the forests of Rwanda and the streets of New York, in the underground workshops of Asia where the children do not grow up and the silent heights of the Andes and in all the places of debasement, degradation, and prostitution, and so many others that flash before our wide open eyes. But we cannot fail to admit that all this is making a noise, an unstoppable murmuring that we, without realizing it, mix it into the mechanical humdrum little tunes of our progress and our driftings. The narrative of progress and development goes hand in hand with the ongoing destitution of the world. But the growing relation among the different places and temporalities that face the destitution of the world paradoxically creates for Glissant the possibility of, quote, changing the imagination of human communities, unquote. Glissant has faith in the power of imagination to succeed where systems and ideologies have failed, particularly because of the way imagination is propelled and rhizomatically disseminated by storytelling practices that reinvent the terms by which to imagine human existence otherwise through concepts and images that can propel, code the themes of hybridity, multilingualism, and creolization, unquote. And for Glissant, hybridity and creolization are not um, identical terms. They're not synonymous in a sense that hybridity is something that you can you know, pre-calculate and preordain where creolization is an event that can be incalculable. It happens as these different oppositions or conflicts bring different collectivities and people together, generating a new conceptual frameworks, new ideas, new aesthetics. And so creolizing or creolization for Glissant is not a teleological practice. It doesn't have a um, uh, it may have a beginning, but it's not, it doesn't um, have a calculated 
end. And so you'll see that in Caribbean thought, if you have ever studied Lisan or if you have had the chance uh, to read um, Caribbean thinkers, including Winter, we are reading together tomorrow. Uh, for them, creolization is a, a kind of aesthetic and political metaphor, which is very important for us today as different cultures uh, are coming together or, you know, are even opposing each other. But of course, I know that some people would ask, is imagination enough to change politics? Then again, has politics ever changed without imagination? Imagination, not as the imaginary, as Celia Brighton, one of, you know, Glissant's very uh, famous translators and literary critics explains. Um, so imagination, not as the imaginary, but as a series of images that reorientate one's thinking towards impossible and unthought, unthought associations that can trigger a change of direction in the way relation can be imagined beyond the national, ethnic, religious, and language attachments. As the loss of soil and homelessness have become the new condition of living for nearly a billion migrants today, almost 14% of the world's population, as Walter Mignolo reminds us in his latest book, uh, relation arises from the deep connections between the different histories of resistance and struggle for living rights in the present. Not just for human rights, as Mignolo rightfully points out, but for living rights, for communal living rights. The whole problem with human rights today is that it focuses only on what you know, is structured as such, according to the Geneva Convention. But the problem now is that we are facing the challenge and task of you know, um, uh, accepting, not only accepting, but um, uh, uh, acknowledging uh, the limitations and circumscriptions that come to, um, that, that delimit uh, human beings' right to living rights. Um, and so there is a debate there going on in decolonial thought as to the conflict between two, the two and the challenge of delimiting the horizon of human rights to discuss you know, communal living rights. Um, and these rights, these living rights in the present, are rooted not in common origins, but rather in the search for new forms of political and social belonging. Having been trained to think of relation primarily through the attachments of the nation and all of its pertinences, we are in dire need to train our imagination to think relation as attached to what Lisan calls le tout monde that arises from, quote, the current clash of so many cultures, pushing each other away, disappearing, but still persisting, sleeping or transforming themselves slowly, slowly or at lightning speed, unquote. To think relation, not above or outside, but from within the unthought associations between different stories and histories that bring together the dispossession and enslavement of human beings in the past, the trafficking of human beings in the present, the Maroon communities of resistance in the mountains of the Caribbean archipelagos, and now in the sprawling squats across Europe, Glissant proposes the trace as the method of poetic inquiry as opposed to the origin of systematic thought. And the trace, he says, acts as a wandering that guides us. Resisting the origin, falling into the trope of the rhizome, the trace is both an aesthetic and a political uh, strategy. And it's the methodology that I follow in this paper. And I, as I'm trying to figure it out myself, I wanted to you know, share with you an example that visualizes the trace in relation to migration and the concept of you know, the human as a migratory concept. Um, so, and this is slide three, okay. Um, so the strategy of the trace in terms of aesthetics can is, a, enable the creation of associations between the different histories and stories of struggle and resistance that foreground this tout monde from within relation, which allows one, Glissant says in his Poetics of Diversity, to sublimate through knowledge of the self and the whole, both suffering and acceptance, the negative and the positive. As a political strategy, the trace attends to what the dominant narratives have tried to force into omission in order to rewrite the stories and histories of those that form 
the part that has no part. This is a famous phrase by Jacques Rancière. So the strategy of the trace uh, is visualized in the work of a documentary artist who I've been following the past few years uh, by the name of Jonah Comfra. I don't know if you have ever encountered his brilliant work. Um, and this particular work uh, called Auto da Fe, Acts of Faith, is a two-channel HD color installation that dramatizes a series of eight historical migrations that have taken place over the last 400 years, starting with the 1645 flight of Sephardic Jews from Catholic Brazil to Barbados and ending with the present-day migrations from Hombori in Mali and Mosul in Iraq. Next slide, please. Um, and maybe the next one, and then I can, yeah. Okay. Um, opposed next to each other, so the whole film runs um, for a sequence of, you know, two video channels that are opposed to each other, and you have a flow of images on the left and another flow of, another flow of images on the right. Um, dramatizing and staging different forms of, you know, migration from different historical moments that are conflated, you know, with each other. Opposed next to each other, each image becomes unveiled in its own course of history that runs parallel with another, taking place at another time and in another place. Despite their historical discontinuity and the time gap that separates them, they narrate what the two different histories and stories that are framed in the separate panels on veil about migration. A running sequence of old portraits, so on the left, I mean, it's not a very good photograph, but you'll see it's a number of, um, it's photographs or portraits of migrants flowing down a river. Uh, migrants from the Asian, African, and Jewish diaspora flowing down the river. So this image is opposed to a series of images of the ruins of an old slave plantation somewhere in Barbados where the film was shot, and then to the expanse of the sea overlooked by Afro-Caribbean or black British subjects who inherit these ruins in the long present. That's slides six. You see that? I mean, this is a shot of one of the photographs, and seven. These are the two images that run opposed to each other. And then the next slide. This is uh, another sequence of a man or a woman at times dressed in what appears to be a 19th century outfit over, you know, um, looks at the sea. Uh, other times in the film, the sea is shoring up debris. Uh, and um, that may be from shipwrecks in the past or in the present. Um, so there's a mixture always of all kinds of uh, signs or symbols that uh, correlate to past and present events of migration, all the way from 1650 to, you know, the 21st century. The, vi the film visualizes relation not as a preconceived object reflected in the images, but rather as the effect of perception. The object reflected triggers the experience of what we, we could call the colonial thesis, that is the perception of the concurrency of these histories that foregrounds movement and dispossession rather than settlement as the origin. The aesthetic aspect of it is that it doesn't create a dialectic relation between these two images, but actually creates, um, dramatizes a rift between them. And so the, eventually what is being perceived is movement and disjuncture rather than a continuity uh, or a linearity between these two histories. And this is what the colonial thinkers like Mignola and others call the colonial thesis, precisely because it negates the frame of dialectics and instead um, uh, uh, focuses on how, you know, um, the viewer perceives the disjuncture, uh, disjuncture and the continuity as the origin of, the, of these histories. And this is a decolonial gesture in a sense that it places movement, mobility and dispossession at the origin of where we stand right now, rather than the opposite, the idea that we all come from, you know, settled cultures that um, at the beginning of everything, there is some kind of an organic community that there is no movement and mobility or dispossession, when in fact, all of us who study colonial modernity, its history know that it begins right there, okay? 
So rather than uh, representing the concrete and material existence of these subjects, the film visualizes the porosity of being as one history of migration run parallel to the other and one image is framed next to the other. But their horizon is shared in the future that is the viewer's present, our present, which is haunted by the ruins and debris of the current histories of migration. A confra uses a trace of the ruin to symptomatically betray the history of rootlessness as inherited by the subjects who visit its ruins and have the luxury to visit its monuments. Uh, these, in fact, when you watch the film, there are a few minutes, there are about eight minutes available uh, for free on YouTube. You'll see that over the portraits flowing down the river, a shadow is cast and it's the shadow of, you know, the person who is, you know, filming this and also our shadow as we're watching it. So it's really very interesting. Following the trace of the ongoing and growing migrations of human beings, I wish to reconstellate what Glissant calls the tout monde, the everywhere and everything that makes the world, the everyone and everything of the world, with what Jean-Luc Nancy and Jacques Derrida call the community of the world in their later works that appears in Jean-Luc Nancy's um, Being Singular Plural and his last work with Barrault, What's This World's Coming To? And in Derrida, this phrase, which is really strange, appears in his last seminar, the second volume of The Beast and the, so and the Sovereign. And I say it's very strange because Derrida has been in his work particularly apprehensive about the white community, unlike Nancy, who has written extensively on it. Through this uncommon phrase that intertwines two discrepant concepts, community and the world, Nancy and Derrida examine the ways by which the world can be thought as the place that hosts and shelters beings as always already mediated by what Nancy calls a being in common. So I want to go into this a little bit with your patience and tolerance, explain what he means by being in common, and then the next gesture would be to leap to Derrida's strange phrase of community of the world from that last and very important for me seminar in which he tries to think about the world and then end you know with something that I will briefly introduce at the beginning just in case we don't have time to get there which is the photograph that gave rise to this book and this project and it's a photograph that I'm going to share with you at the beginning and at the end okay I know this is not very French in a sense of you know the three part Essay, but I'm Greek, as you know, and I have a very loud voice, as we have already established. <laughs> okay, so Nancy translates this being in common into what he calls the profusion of the species, aspects, and manners of the existing, of the fertile push of the living. And that's from the What's This World's Coming To. This profusion suggests that the diverse forms of being within the world and the dissident and unpredictable relations that arise from within this with remain unaccountable to the market economy of the globalized world because they refer to all kinds of relations that are um, uh, often incalculable, that are tentative, that are temporary, that relate human beings to other species. Um, and so not necessarily aspects of relation that can be easily commodified or even when they are, that doesn't mean that they cannot generate resistance, okay? And I'm not a great Nancy expert, but I, this is the first time I see him, you know, go off this analysis of the ontic and the ontological and so on and so forth to so talking about being in such a reciprocity and rationality, relationality that it speaks to forms of um, relation that are not anthropocentric, let's put it this way. And this is something that Derrida also does in his... He has done it in his work on the animal, but he repeats it much more, um, in a much more emphatic way in the last seminar. Despite the economic and political treaties that regulate the trafficking and mobility of commodities, of human beings and of capital, singularities and collectivities resist and remain unaccountable to the rationale of neoliberal politics, even when an, uh, if they are, even when they are exploited as a cheap labor force. As Maria Lugones, who is 
another important decolonial feminist thinker I, I use in my work, as she argues, the subjects that inhabit the colonial or neocolonial difference are active and capable of multiple and concurrent forms of resistance that take the form of particular, small, but meaningful acts such as code, clothing, food, economies and ecologies, gestures, rhythms, habitats, and sense of space and time, unquote. Such practices that affirm life over profit give rise to modalities of being with that materialize the community of the world through a series of social and political practices that promise to reworld the world against the limiting and xenophobic horizon of the national state in the name of the to come of democracy. So basically what I'm trying to sketch here is how relevant what Nancy and Derrida you know, do in their latest works in terms of being with and relation is um, to a decolonial thought that has been going on for a while now about a non-anthropocentric and non-eurocentric understanding of relation and exchange, even when it comes to this taking place uh, within the colonial matrix, matrix of power. And of course, they take off from indigenous epistemologies and gnosiologies that without rejecting the European canon correlate to you know, certain European philosophers. Uh, Levinas is among the philosophers that you know, we see in the work of people like Maldonado Torres. But I think Derrida and Nancy have something to offer here that, is, um, that makes the reconstellation of this thought very, very interesting. It can trigger a new way to think about you know, what Glissant calls relation. And that's what I want to try and do uh, here, or at least what I'm trying to do here. Uh, in Europe and elsewhere, as we know, the migrants have often been represented as a virus that can threaten the hosting communities, both politically and biologically. And should that thus be fenced off, deterred and detained in camps to secure and maintain the so-called cultural integrity uh, or, uh, of Europe and the safety of the borders of its states. However, this response has threatened the present and yet to come of democratic societies, as we know raising walls to secure their populations from their continuous arrival of the undocumented migrants and refugees. Democratic states have often breached the ethical and legal orders of human rights and of living rights, and in the name of security have paradoxically attacked uh, one of the core values of the democratic community, what Jean-Luc Jean Nancy has called the constitutive exposition of its essence of being and common meaning. Uh, to a critique of, all, of its ontological and political presupposition, thus struggling against what Derrida has identified the constitutive autoimmunity of democracy. So basically, in studying several cases of squats and migrants um, uh, and refugees, not only across the European borders, but across you know, the American borders and other borders today, one wonders what happens to democracy, at least in those societies that you know, uphold the name, okay? We're talking about those societies that identify themselves as democratic societies. So these are two photos. This is, these are the two photos that, you know, have triggered some of this question. This is from the refuge. This is an actual squat in Athens um, that has been going on for a number of years now that has housed not only migrants and refugees, you know, that are arriving today, but all migrants and refugees from as old as the 1920s, from the Asia, from after the period, um, from, from the end of the Asia Minor Wars. So this is an old building that was actually constructed to house migrants, and it has been there since 1920 at the center of Athens, near, you know, um, a major avenue, Alexandras Avenue. And this building is being maintained um, by activists and migrants and poor people and unemployed people who, because of the mortgage crisis, uh, as we know, have lost you know, their homes. And the refuge is not a unique case. There's several such places, you know, many, many, many cases like that in Rome and Berlin and Barcelona um, across Europe and I'm sure across the world. So that's one photograph. And the other photograph, uh, this is from uh, the inside the building. Um, these are photographs 
taken and documentary made by Nikos Pilos, whose work has inspired me to do this project. And it shows you how, how you know, the, um, the building is inhabited by its tenants. This is Mrs. Sophia, who actually cannot go out because she's too old and too sick. And she cooks for several men in the building who actually go out and get her medication and, you know, bring her food. And the entire um, building, you know, operates like a community of not only survivors, but people who try to remodel the way by which they live together, uh, fighting for not only their basic human rights, but for their living rights. And the other photograph, which was, and this is the next one, and that has haunted me, and this is what I'm going to end up with, was taken at a time when uh, the Moria camp, the infamous Moria camp in Lesbos, which um, housed more, I think, four or five times more people than, you know, um, uh, it, it could, uh, was burned down, and as a result of which a lot of people found shelter in the local cemetery uh, near these tombstones. So oh, these, these, these trigger the following questions for me. Can these instances force us to imagine relation um, and to imagine another political alternative to thinking about community uh, relation and the world together rather than as two oppositional terms in a dialectical relation which can only result in the destruction of the one at the expense of the other. So we think about community and the world or a relation and the world as oppositional terms. And I'm thinking, is there a way that these cases and other similar cases can, you know, uh, offer a different political alternative um, by which we can think about community and the world through what Glissant calls relation. So I'll try to engage this question and maybe respond by affiliating Nancy and Derrida's philosophical examination of the community of the world with Glissant's to Monde. I think that all these formations, community of the world, uh, tout monde, relation, notwithstanding their different political and philosophical context, are grounded in being as what Nancy calls being with. I wish to explore their examination of being with through their work in my attempt to think through the current urgency of living with the foreigners, the strangers, and the so-called rogues. Glissant's relation as to monde, Nancy's insistence that community, its poetics and politics be thought as bare of a kind of prior essence, and there it does, you know, community of the world and call for a democracy to come um, that remains open to the open-ending reinvention of its demos are for me the subdending philosophical axioms of what these two thinkers call the community of the world and what Glissant calls the tout monde, each time recreated by those who represent the to come those who arrive and keep arriving in the present and manifest a future time of politics as urgently present. So the to come or you know, future present are not utopic terms in a sense that they don't gesture to a future that is not here, but they actually acknowledge the fact that the future is here, except that we don't have the terms by which to refer to its newness so that we can, by affirming it, acknowledge its urgencies and take action. Um, so I'll just go ahead with Nancy and, you know, go through some of his key ideas about being with and then move on to Derrida so that we can return to this photograph. Um, in the inoperative community, Nancy opposes um, the, the liberal euphoria of the 90s that was generated by the presumed end of the struggle for other imaginings of community, politics, and the world by proposing that community be thought as something whose becoming is not identifiable with the work of a nation state, a specific city or ethnic collectivity, but something, but rather as something that re, re, remains, as he says, désivré, inoperative. That is, as a community that always in the making does not come from a, an origin that predetermines its end. Even when community appears to be originating from an origin or a beginning, and is identified with the work of a genealogical society 
whose origin predetermines its end product, as in the case, for instance, of the myth of the national community. It is bound by what he calls being in common, defined not by the unity of the one, but by what he <coughs> calls the experience of its sharing. And this is from his earlier work, inoperative, called Inoperative Community. And this experience of sharing, the experience of its sharing, cannot be foreclosed by the discourses of, of origins and beginnings. In 1995, when Nancy writes Being Singular Plural, he, plural, he describes the world through a list of events whose proper names mark the disintegration, dissolution, and transformation of different communities, and suggests the difficulty, if not impossibility, of sharing the world. Such events include uh, the Balkan Wars in the 90s, the Palestinian struggles from emancipation, ethnic and civil wars, conflict zones in the Middle East and across the world, and reveal several disasters of community and the human, of community and of the human. Such events foreground a world plagued by neocolonial politics, military and economic wars, and the fights and bloodshed that turned the earth into anything but a sharing of humanity quote unquote, and deprive the world of what gives it meaning, which is the different and discrepant ways of humans inhabiting and sharing the earth that constitute the world. Uh, late, so, you know, this is, um, let's just say, a more, um, it's not the, the, the it's, it's a step in his way to thinking about community that in 2001 and in the wake of 9-11 transform, is transformed when Nancy returns to Maurice Blanchot's The Unavowable Community and his early work on the inoperative community to think the command. So like from the um, inoperative community, which is uh, a text that recognizes the impossibility of you know, transgressing the limits of sharing the world as a, um, and, and as a result of nationalistic or ethnic and religious attachments that generate the disaster of the world and the human, he moves on to a text where he starts thinking of community and le commun a bit differently, not as a being in common, but as a being with, under the provision that this with is not preceded by a prior condition of expected intimacy that promises an assemblage or a form of togetherness. So he starts thinking of um, thinking the term community without assemblage, which is, you know, the, the, the step that he wants to take in his work. In view of 9-11, yet another world disaster that shatters an image of the world and reveals the world as image, Nancy coins with as a kind of dry and neutral term that describes the act of sharing place and temporality through the mere contact of singularities propelled by this being with in all of its anthropomorphic but also animal and uh, immaterial manifestations. And this is the next slide, I think. Yeah, these are some quotes I want to read and I wanted to you know, share with you. With is neither communion nor atomization, but only contact, being part of a place, a being together without assemblage. La vec est sec et neutre, ni communion, ni atomisation, seulement le partage d'un lien, tout au plus en contact, and être ensemble sans assemblage. Rather than read this event, 9-11 as a war between civilization, Nancy proposes that it be thought as a symptom of a gap or rift within community that forces it to affront itself, to confront the undoing or unworking by the very act of sharing and living with, especially when such forms take the form of incalculable and unexpected forms of being with. For Nancy, the possibility of a non-communitarian community is grounded not in the assemblage of a political order, whether capitalist or communist, but should rather be thought as part of what he calls being with. Now for Nancy, um, Nancy does not think being with as a secondary code or an extrinsic way to being oneself or being in solitude, but rather as an essential constitution of being. In other words, with does not follow being as a supplement, and does not modify the essence of being, but instead functions as its indissolubly related element. And he challenges and transforms Heidegger's, Martin Heidegger's mid-sign, 
um, in a radical and decisive way that allies, aligns being with and the world as mutually constitutive terms. And he reads with as the ontological, social, and political relation of being to other beings and entities that make up the world as they are thrown together into the world. Giving priority to being with, Nancy associates being with in the world and the being of the world through a conjunction with that forces both being and the world to remain open to the ontopolitical conditions of survivance, existence, and the ongoing reinventions, and the ongoing reinvention of the various modalities of living with conditions that always challenge politics and transform the political. Examining being with as both the ontological and the political foundation of the community of the world, where it is constantly transformed of the politics of unaccountable and unpredictable forms of living with, Nancy underlines the worldly character that each collectivity and community have under the exigencies of globalization, which on the one hand commodifies beings, cultures, and humans, but on the other triggers the encounter between their various poetics, relations, and, imagine, and imaginings. Um, okay. With, I mean, and I'll just keep that, that long part, but um, so what I want to hold on from Nancy is that with does not simply supplement being, so this idea of living together or of relation is not something that comes as a supplement to you know, our singularities or individualities, but it's constitutive of you know, being present, of being, you know, being, you know, being alive, being who we are. And he proposes that being is together, and it's not a togetherness, okay? So that we have to start thinking of being as this form of, as this modality of you know, the together rather than as a number of beings that you know, are a form of togetherness. A thesis that resonates with decolonial thinkers such as Glissant, Sylvia Winter, and Leso Nado Torres, whose works still link being from the metaphysics of presence of the overrepresented white man, and engage a poetics of being that is relational and therefore rhizomatic. Now, when I say that he radicalizes Heidegger's thought, basically he radicalizes our understanding of being as you know, a singularity, a sovereign self that then creates, you know, a form of togetherness by supplementing, you know, itself, the singularity, uh, with the, uh, through the relations with other humans. Okay, so he transforms that and says, no, if we won't have to start thinking about being always already as being with, as something that is ontologically prior to everything, and this is a radical gesture in, you know, Western philosophy. Um, and this together, this together that he talks about, forces us to reconceptualize the being of singularity, not as a kind of ipsity, that is, as a sovereign self that always remains similar to itself and takes the form of the one who never changes by the arrival of the other, but rather as a modality of being that is always in conjunction and reciprocity with other beings and not just humans, but species even lifeless or what we consider to be lifeless forms like the earth, the soil, the stones, the water, so on and so forth. Um, this challenges the idea of a togetherness that precedes the arrival of others and functions more as a force that tries to integrate all four elements into a never changing whole, be it a set community of a world that has become, or be it a, be it a consolidated community or a world that has become a totality. Such forms of togetherness are implied and desired in the policies of integration that are implemented across Europe nowadays and have bitterly failed, as we know, often, often with little success be precisely because they operate as a closed system that attempts to incorporate and adjust their others to metaphysics of presence and a politics of sameness that excludes them as absolute and therefore undesirable strangers. Nancy instead proposes that the being of singularity be thought as always open and disrupted by the with that conditions each singularity to be the anticipation of the arrival of another, of a friend, or an enemy, or an absolute stranger. And this with is what founds for Nancy the community of the world. Now, uh, this phrase appears also, and this is in 
you know, a phrase that appears, as I said, in his work with uh, physicist Barrow in What's This World's Coming To? And this phrase appears also in Derrida's last seminar, the one that he gave before he died in 2004, um, called The Beast and the Sovereign. Sovereign. And in this last seminar, Derrida also refers to this phrase, the community of the world, where he extracts being with from the non-hierarchic and rhizomatic relation among humans, animals, and stones. Now, his work on the animal may be, you know, uh, very well known to you, but what the interesting thing he does in this seminar is that he talks about, you know, um, he deconstructs this idea of being with, with the anthropos or with the human at the center by talking about um, not only animals, but stones that we often take to be lifeless forms. And, you know, um, he performs a gesture in this seminar that is very interesting and resonates with, all, with what some anthropologists are doing right now so that we change our understanding of being within the world so that this, you know, so that maybe being human in the world becomes a less destructive force. So Derrida's seminar ends with a question of the world as other to the Western philosophical presupposition of the world as the object of knowledge that can be studied in a complete and utter isolation from it as if other beings and life forms misrepresented as being without world, without a world, did not and should not matter because in fact they are integral to the being of the world. What, that, what does it mean for he, to inhabit or cohabit the world beyond the horizon of these presuppositions that have relied on a hierarchy of being. You know, he deconstructs Heidegger's idea of animals, humans, and stones being in a, forming a certain kind of hierarchy. So humans are the ones, you know, who have the world. Uh, animals are poor in the world, and stones are without world. So he takes these three concepts, these three uh, pairs, uh, uh, humans as builders of the world, animals as poor in the world, and stones as without world, and he deconstructs this horizon so that he explains this being with in the world in this kind of uh, non-anthropocentric and non-hierarchical way. To think being through the gathering of humans, animals, and stones, um, um, to think being through the gathering of humans, animals, and stones, a gathering, you know, that actually threatens uh, Robinson Crusoe, the overrepresented white man uh, he talks about in his last seminar, who shipwrecked, um, who shipwrecked on the island and isolated from the world, claims he, this piece of land as his own. Um, Derrida uh, investigates the meaning of the world as something that is affected by the propelling force of the gathering uh, that gives shape to what he calls the community or otherwise of the world. So, you know, he goes against this idea of human being being alone on an island, conquering soil, domesticating the land and Friday and the animals, to thinking about stones, animals, and human beings as this form of gathering that gives rise to what he calls in his seminar, the community of the world. This gathering involves not only humans and animals that inhabit the same world, that is never one because of their different and often discrepant temporalities, but also stones as the footprints that signal the nearby presence and imminent arrival of other beings. In Derrida's text, the stone is the stumbling block, Pierre d'Achopement, he calls it, that unsettles Heidegger's taxonomy that places human as the world-forming beings above animals that are poor in the world and stones that are without world. The stone speaks to other sovereignties that the white man on the island has disavowed as non-existent. The discovery, uh, maybe that's the next slide uh, and the next one, sorry. This is from actually uh, Tanya Defoe's Robert, Robert Crusoe. Uh, when the discovery of the human footprint on the beach sends a frantic Crusoe back to his fortification in this belief that someone else should be nearby and that may have arrived there in his place, 
on his island that must be empty of the prints or monuments of others because he alone has arrived and claimed it as his. But rather than the voice text that Derrida is trying to deconstruct in the seminar, I want to turn to Patrick Chamoiseau's Le Printa Crusoe that dramatizes the importance of stones, rocks, and other living presences that challenge the narrative of the white man who writes himself into being outside and beyond any relation with others, be they humans, animals, or stones, in order to found the colonial grammar of being that relies on the strategic exclusion of all its others. So in the seminar, Derrida you know, takes Robinson Crusoe and tries to see what does it mean to be an isolated white man on the island and what actually uh, does the practice of colonization involve even when he's alone? You know, he will domesticate the land, he will domesticate the goat, he will domesticate, domesticate the native so that he alone secures uh, his sovereignty over the place. Um, but in Patrick Chamoiseau's uh, text that rewrites Robinson Crusoe, something else happens. Uh, and relation is paradoxically revealed when the thrown overboard nameless survivor discovers that he's alone on this island, despite his initial hopes that the fruit print that he had discovered on the beach one day belonged to another human being. So same story goes there, except that the man on the island is African, um, that he's called Crusoe because, you know, the guy who threw him overboard to kill him, you know, was the captain's name, Crusoe. And he, he tries to, you know, colonize the land and create the kind of relation to it that, you know, was the practice that he learned on board of the slaver, except that he bitterly fails and instead tries to relate to himself through what Glissant calls relation with the soil itself, the earth and other species. So in Samoiseau's text, Samoiseau offers his poetic meditation on being that takes off from the story of Robinson Crusoe to deconstruct the myth of man as the superior sovereign being that can order the universe around him and domesticate the soil in order to build the infrastructure of his civilization that impinges on the environment. But Chamoiseau's shipwrecked human is not the foist white man on an island. Thrown overboard by the captain of a slaver, this African man whose real name is Ogotemeli tries to make sense of the world alone on an island after he has labored on a slaver as an obedient sailor under Captain Crusoe's orders, helping him and his crew transport Africans to the Americas where they would be thrown into the slave plantations. Having lost his memory, or rather having lost his mind, hearing the cries of other Africans in the hold, Ogotemeli, Ogotemeli stops obeying his captain Crusoe, who decides to throw him at sea near the island that becomes his home. Unable to remember his native origins, having repressed the trauma of working on a slaver, he takes on the name of his captain, Crusoe, that is not his, and starts imagining the presence of someone else on the island, trying to fortify the place against this other person so that he colonizes it, doing exactly what you know, um, 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 they were do doing during the slave trade. When he discovered that this other, as he has imagined him, uh, does not exist, he realizes that his being on this island has become dependent on a relation with the island itself, its water, its animals, its plants, its rocks, and wind. He says, I find myself facing another self, the whole entire island, I now perceived it like a multitude that touched me, grabbed me, squeezed me, as if I were immersed in a mass of presences, imperious and lively. Yes, presences. The island itself emerges as an infinite mosaic of presences that emerged everywhere, in the trees and the rocks, grass, and imposed the intensity of their soul existence. And rather than the, phantasm the phantasmic other with an infinitely powerful thirst and desire for humanity, he discovers how dependent his being is on, quote, each blade of grass, each ancestral tree or lack thereof, each lavish or humble uh, landscape. The entire infrastructure that he builds and resonates with the civilizational plan of the Forest Crusoe is revealed as a redundant structure made of an imagined administration of rules and regulations that apply to nothing other than a fabricated sovereignty. Um, 
In the process, Ogotemeli realizes that the presences that he discovers on the island bear a meaning of being with that cannot be contained, not remitted by the anthropocentric narrative of man. Now, more than an ecological reading of being that places the human in non-hierarchical relation um, with uh, other species uh, and nature, Chamoiseau's text offers a geological perspective into the meaning of being with that resonates with Glissant and C and Derrida's community of the world. And that's why I wanted to briefly take it in, although I'm not doing justice to the text. Ogotemeli reinvents himself in his coexistence with the thousand creature allies, as he calls them, emerging through a horizontal relation with species, rocks, and life food entities, which shatters the colonial structure of being that hierarchizes species and humans and divides them in a taxonomic order. Modeling himself on the idea, on this idea of the human, uh, Ogotemeli refuses to become uh, Crusoe. Uh, um, he no longer, he's no longer invested in preserving life at the expense of other living beings, but is rather interested in providing for and maintaining life, the life of other entities. He, including animals and nature. He embodies an activity against colonialism that resonates with the fight of the indigenous people right now against what we call extractivismo that dispossesses millions of people today. And that as Macarena Gomez Paris demonstrates in extractive zone code, sees territories as commodities, rendering land as for the taking, while also devalorizing the hidden worlds that form the nexus of human and non-human multiplicity. I wanted to go through Gotemeli so that Derrida's analysis of stones uh, in the process resonates precisely with this effort, not to think about stones in any kind of only animistic way, but to think of how in indigenous and native cultures they represent life full forms that by extracting, you know, um, uh, resources from the soil of these people, not only are they forced into destitution and dispossession, but they're also forced into uh, migration as their only means of survival. This is you know, often something that we forget when we ask questions such as, what are these people from the end of the world are doing here? Why have they crossed so many seas and lands to arrive at the borders of Europe just to die? And one has to wonder, um, one has to think about the kind of history of dispossession that underlies this, which is you know, rooted in this idea that human beings uh, as you know, um, beings have a priority over not only animals, but also the earth itself. And so reconfiguring his relation to being through an infinite mosaic of presences, and that's the next slide. This is a stone that I want to share with you. I'll tell you the story about it later. Um, the shipwrecked human discovers a stone as one of the many lifeful forms that undergird being with. In Lewis Edrich, Edrich's words, and that's the next slide, um, the stone is a spiritual, no, I'm sorry, further down, I should have read this, yeah, here. The stone is a spiritual geography, a teaching and dreaming guide in native and indigenous cultures, and a monument that attests to the multiple histories of resistance. Stones in general, uh, gestein, water as a whole, gewasser, Everything that grows, gewax, and the set of animals, getir. All are driven, Derrida insists, by the same form of a gathering, ge, in German it's kum, with, that renders the boundaries between human intentionality and animal and life forms like stones and rivers opaque. This gathering, ge, kum, forces Western metaphysics and its colonial grammar of being to tremble, shaking it off its grounds. In Elizabeth Povinelli's terms, this geontological gathering countervails the systematic measurement of all forms of existence by the qualities of one form of existence, particularly the bios and zoe of man. In geontologies, Povinelli critically examines forms of non-life, like the creek or the fog, that are fundamental to the communities of the indigenous people in Australia for their survival, uh, but are recognized by neoliberal policies only as constitutive of cultural and thus racial differences. The indigenous people's multiple usages of non-life forms like water or fog 
to reinvent a sense of commons and their attachment to land, water, and its elements are seen as part of a social and political being that has, quote unquote, no, no part. And this is from her recent work, not recent work, but from one of her books from her trilogy called Economies of Abandonment. Povinelli argues that the power to distinguish between life that matters and on life thus ascribes humans to the category of forms of existence that can be managed as if they were non-life. Strange as it is, and I know that, to turn to Povinelli's text, her critique reveals how neoliberalism manages not only the bodies and bios of human cultures, but also a variety of elements that affect their relationship to the earth, what Latour, Bruno Latour calls their right to soil, as a right not given, but is rather exercised, but as a right that is rather exercised and fleshed out from this differential gathering of beings, stones, and animals and its propelling forces. This management of life and non-life reveals the ability of neoliberalism to determine and define the horizon of what it means to be human and manage the resources human beings rely on to expand that horizon and claim their right to belong. Derrida and Glissant share eclectic affinities with Povinelli's geontology and of and of course, Nancy, in that sense, um, uh, share affinities with Povinelli's geontology that characterizes all existence as endowed with the qualities associated with life. Stone cannot, stones cannot only speak, as Derrida hints, but also listen, as Derrida, as Povinelli has argued in her work. They signify the resistance rather than ability of various indigenous and native communities to differentiate the kinds of things that have agency, subjectivity, and intentionality of the sort that emerges, of the sort that emerges with life. This, I think, resonates with Glissant's Du Monde, um, uh, like the, um, in a sense that uh, the Du Monde arises as the community of the world um, that is the gathering, as he says, of everything, tout entière, of everyone, tout à celle, unique and of every other, tout autre, as ontologically prior to being with a capital B, to a prior essence that predetermines existence, which is manifested and materialized in beings. And um, I think um, I'll just skip a part, and then I want to end with a paragraph. And um, um, actually, I want to turn to, you know, the the, the photograph that I started with, uh, briefly taking a pause here because I know that I have exhausted you. And let's just go to this one. So, and say therefore, thinking th about this question, the being of the community of the world, um, and looking at these stones, what, you know, would, if we were to listen to them, what would they say and how would they respond to the question of living together? What kind of political alliances and solidarities without assemblage do we need to imagine and create in order to attend to the community or otherwise of the world that is being disenclosed here? I want to end with this photograph that conjures all these modalities of relation, Glissant's chaos world, Nancy's meet Zion as being, uh, Derrida's messy with, um, all of them traces of what they call tout monde or the community of the world. This photograph was taken in September 2020 when the Moria Reception and Identification Center, widely known as the Moria Camp on the island of Lesbos, the, or the worst refugee camp on earth, as a journalist has called it, was raised to the ground. The result was the exodus of 13,000 migrants from a place where they, were, had been, where they had been stranded since the migration crisis in the Mediterranean peaked in 2015. So-called migration crisis because it is the phenomenon of migration rather than crisis. The fire was said to have been started by the migrants as an act of despair against their entrapment on the island, but also as an act of dissent against their forced immobilization by the EU laws that turned the Aegean islands into large camps for the arriving migrants and refugees. One of the photographs taken shows a few men resting between the tombstones in a nearby graveyard under the shade of an olive tree. This provisional um, moment of sharing the earth by resting on the stones, monuments to a community that is past and the one that is present, 
attest to the persevering right to soil, rights, living rights, and polity. It is a being with that arises from within the reciprocity between the remains of those who have passed away, whose tombstones, however, also mark the impossibility of bearing and mourning those who have drowned at sea in this long present. In this provisional cohabitation of the earth, the dead and the living form their own gathering without any prior assemblage, except for this an even sharing of the ontological and political condition of being with. The photograph portrays an impossible and temporary cohabitation between the living and the dead, the foreigners and the hosts meeting at the tombstones of the dead, both the dead that are commemorated and the dead that have not been mourned, as in the case of the drowned. It also stages one of the possible sites of the political, at least this is my opinion in the present, where the possibility of the community of the world without assemblage takes the form of an incalculable gathering that calls for justice as irreducible to law and politics, which are challenged by the figure of the Santerre, whose arrival, unanticipated and often bothersome and welcome, forces into appearance new modalities of living with and fugitive sovereignties that, like stumbling rocks, interrupt one's progress and oblige one's to lift one's foot to carry the other. And that's a line from Derrida. Thank you. Thank you for being so patient.